welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here and thanks to Stephanie and your team for lunch and logistics and get it, getting us all in the same place. Uh, we have a great agenda in front of us this afternoon with the budget workshop and we also have a report from our general counsel and consideration of a resolution regarding Proposition HH. So we will start with roll call. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Alvin Vandenbrink? Here. <laughs> Doug Monger? Here. John Ely? Kathleen Curry? Here. Kathy Chandler Henry? Here. Mark Catlin? Here. Mark Rober? Here. Martha Whitmore? Mike Richard? Rebe Hazard? Here. Scott McGinnis, Stan Winery, Steve Beckley, here. Taylor Haas, here. Tom Gray. Here. And uh, thank you. We do have a quorum. And Reby and Doug, thank you for joining us virtually. We will try to pay attention to if you want to talk, but if we miss you, just uh, jump in there. I am going to turn things over to Andy Mueller and Audrey. To lead us off on the budget workshop and explain why they are doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so you probably expected to see our uh, chief financial officer, Ian Phillips, here. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Ian um, has decided that motorized sports are more fun than attending a board meeting and uh, broke his fibula and a few uh, tendons in his um, leg and just came out of surgery about an hour ago. Um, apparently is doing well, but is not able to perform his duties here at the district. We'll make sure that he gets docked appropriately. Um, but in his absence, um, Audrey's going to uh, lead us through the budget discussion uh, with a little bit of assistance from me and uh, Betty over there. And um, we'll see if we can't cover the, the, the matters well. So uh, I'm going to hand it off to Audrey. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and luckily, Ian is prepared and had started his budget workshop outline, which we'll be working off um, and so I apologize if I can't answer the questions as well as Ian may have, but we'll certainly follow up if we're unable to answer anything today. So we're going to talk about, um, we're going to start off with the general fund revenue. We'll talk about 2023 and proposed 2024. And we're going to move through the expenditures in the general fund for 2023 and 2024. Um, we'll talk about the capital budget, the CFP budget, and then we'll finish with the enterprise fund. Um, we're going to cover things that kind of a high level, but are happy to go into any level of detail that you want to talk about any specific line items. I have some of the highlights that I'm gonna talk about, and then I'll also be leaning on some of the, the directors for the departments um, and Melissa for CFP to, to cover some of the details under those specific um, items as well. So starting off on general fund revenue, let me just see if I can. You guys can read that, right? <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll cover 2023 first. Um, we started off the general fund with a revenue balance of $3.2 million. No? I just, and just in case you didn't find it, it is, there is a sheet sitting at everybody's um, table with, with the revised numbers for the revenue. Just, just to, so you can follow along because it is hard to okay. <laughs> that yeah that's the that's the valuation oh, I'm sorry it's the valuation um yeah. but maybe this one will be easier for you to see Okay, so we have property tax revenue in 2023 estimate at 9.75 million um, at our mill of 0.5. 
Um, there's a significant line item of specific ownership tax as well of 775. And then one of the things that is actually not on this chart, but it is in your general fund summary is interest income, which uh, interest rates are doing really well right now. Uh, we've moved some of the money in the general fund to some different investments and they're getting uh, anywhere from three to five, well, two in the cash account and then, but up to 5.7%, 5.4% 5%, 5 um, return and in interest rates right now. So we have a significant increase in our interest income line item at 183 as the 183,000 is the estimate for 2023, which is uh, quite a bit from what we had originally proposed in the budget. Okay. We also have some other income in that other revenue line item. We have a small revenue from our seminar, um, which is coming up tomorrow, estimated at $3,000, $6,750 from a management fee, which is when we charge a 3% for pass-through funds when we're accepting grants from the CWCB or others, and we charge a management fee. We also have cloud seeding revenue, um, $278,000, uh, in 2023, which is also sort of some pass through. It's for, through partnerships and grant funding. And then we also have an offsetting expenditure in that as well. And then there's um, there's two other items. One not as significant, um, but is, is also included in the 2023 budget, which is uh, a grant that we have applied for, um, for ASO, which is the Airborne Snow Observatory, um, some of those snow studies that we have. Um, an outstanding grant application to the Bureau. And I believe that we've also been successful for the CWCB grant for some of that funding, which is also in the revenue there. And then we also have something that was not included in the original budget, but we did discuss at the January meeting, which is a, um, a CWCB grant for uh, our work with the Freshwater Trust on the water conservation decision supports, um, decision support tool. Yeah, so that's why the, that other revenue item or the re other revenue line item is pretty significant in 2023 as well as 2024. That's mostly related to those, those large pass-through grants. And so we'll see correlating expenditures um, when we get into the expenses as well. So before we move into the expenses, we wanted to talk a little bit about our estimated revenue um, and some of the options that we're facing for revenue projections in 2024. So if, let me see if I now I can switch to that. Or if you're looking at the assessed valuations sheet that Andy was handing out. It's, we've been talking about the increase in, in the assessed valuations for a while now. So you may recall that 2023 was a reappraisal year, which was based on sales as of June 30, 2022. And our overall preliminary net assessed values are up 44.5% overall. Um, and that's all of the counties. And, but we will, you know, we want to note that there was a, a significant variance between our counties, ranging from 2% increase in assessed valuation all the way up to 65% increase um, in that assessed valuation. So new construction slightly decreased and there was also some increased um, oil and gas, new oil and gas wells in Rio Blanco and Garfield County. All right, so this is pretty hard to see probably for you all, it might be easier to see um, the one that was a handout. And the reason why we have a handout, there was an error, a typo in the one that was included in the packet. So this is the corrected version. based on the print date. Yeah. <laughs> right, Betty, is this the right one? I think it's the same as the printout one that I have on my PDF here. Um, so as, as you know, the, the correlation um, at our mill, and you know, we want to thank our voters for supporting us in 2020 at the ballot, um, our revenue could increase 44%, um, which is gets us up to 14.7 million roughly in net property tax revenue. 
but as we know, there's some other factors going on as well. And so I'm happy to, to kick it off. And maybe Andy, if you want to talk about some of those other revenue scenarios that we're, we're facing with Proposition HH, as well as some of, um, you know, an alternative that the boards and some other governments are considering uh, a voluntary reduction in revenue. Thank you. I'm taking it that your entire call in 2023 is inaccurate on the handout to us, correct? So is that whole column? <coughs> what? So yeah, I'm sorry. So the one that I do have in my that I pulled out from the board packet is wrong. The one that is printed is right. And I can pull that one up too. So that how, is where the 29. Do, I thought maybe we had a slight error, but these are pretty dramatic differences. So what happened? Do we know? I, I know it. It looks Ian's like the here. 2022 column was just copied and pasted into 2023 on the one that's in that's, error. That's not the one. Oh. I see what you're coming. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, and I pulled I pulled these PDFs down from um, the packet print, the packet ones, which was incorrect. So I okay. apologize for that. The printed one is correct. I can I can uh, try to pull that one up for um, you, Director Munger and Director Hazard on the on the Zoom. So what you're what we're looking at right here is this on uh, this. Oh, my mouse isn't working very quickly, but in the 2023, the one that I'm displaying right now, which was included in the, the digital packet and the original mailing is incorrect. Let me pull up the right one. All right, so while, um, while Audrey's doing that, I. I wanted to just talk to the board. I think we covered this in the memo to some extent, but um, you know we face a number of challenges uh, or potential futures here. And so um, keep in mind because of Proposition HH being on the ballot, we don't expect uh, this board to be able to set its final budget till, until either early December if HH fails at the, to, to gain approval of the ballot, or if HH passes, it may actually be early January in which you would have a special meeting the first week of January. So um, the HH is an interesting uh, measure, extremely complex um, and covered in the, in the memo to a, a, a greater degree of detail than I think I'll go through in a summary form here. Um, but from the staff and council's perspective at the River District, um, we believe that our voter approved revenue from 2020 um, is in fact exempt from the uh, revenue cap, the growth cap rate in uh, NHH. Um, so the, where the district would suffer uh, negative financial uh, repercussions actually lies in the change in assessment ratio and the credit that HH and its accompanying statute, um, the uh, statute that, that created HH uh, would would effectively limit um, or, or change the assess residential assessment ratio and the and the assessment ratio for commercial properties and not uh, basically notch those down um, and then give a credit to uh, uh, residential properties uh, in in value or I say credit it would decrease the value of each residential property um, by a certain amount in the first two years of the uh, that, that we're looking at it. That would impact us, and, and uh, Ian's calculations are that we're looking at about, um, if, if HH passes, a, approximately a 3.5% decrease in revenue, equates to about $500,000 in revenue for uh, 2024 and beyond. Um, it, it's not, obviously that's that's not gonna make or break the district necessarily. It may mean, depending on, on your desires, that we would have uh, less money to fund high priority projects that the district has. Um, 
but it 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 is uh, it's not a, a crippling amount to the district. I will say that a number of our other um, uh, local districts in w the Western Slope who do not have vote recently voter approved revenue changes. So that's our our seven A from twenty twenty. Um, will not have that same luxury. Their, their revenue will in fact be limited by the growth factor contained in Proposition HH if it passes. Um, and, and so uh, while this district I think um, isn't, it isn't gonna be uh, necessarily crippled by HH, it is, we're, we're looking at a number of our, our uh, fire districts, our library districts, other special districts that would in fact have some pretty serious consequences. Um, Maybe not our, our board's concern, but I would just say uh, that that's out there. So um, again, just thinking about it, we have a budget that we are presenting, assuming that HH does not pass. Um, it, in the current budget, it also does not include any um, voluntary reduction in the mill level. If this board directs us to do that, we can come back to you in October with um, a, a budget that would contain that reduction, that voluntary reduction in the mill levy, um, and therefore reduce the, the 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 tax burden on taxpayers and 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 the income uh, for the district. Um, one concern staff has with that, uh, well, we have a couple of concerns. Um, one is that we actually have a situation um, where uh, you have proper, or excuse me, Initiative 50, um, which is scheduled currently uh, appears to be uh, headed for the ballot, not this year, but in 2024. And uh, Initiative 50 uh, contains a 3% cap on growth of revenue, but um, actually is it three, Peter, or four, 4%, but it, it, Peter and I have discussed this, the language in that proposition is really hard to understand. Um, in that it's based on a, a cap of 4% of statewide growth in property tax. Well, our property tax isn't based on statewide growth. It's based on, on, on valuation growth within our district. And so it's very difficult to understand how that will apply to this district. But uh, one reading, and I would say my reading um, from just having interactions with Michael Fields and, and the, the group that's pushing it, their intent behind that language is to cap all growth by any government entity at 4% um, uh, in terms of their, their revenue in the future. That's regardless of what inflation does, it's regardless of what local growth does, it's regardless of, irregardless of what the voters may or may not have approved uh, previously or uh, uh, you know, at, at, at that time. So it, the concern I have, um, is that if this board voluntarily reduces its mill levy and then Proposition 50 passes, that we would essentially be in that situation we were in when um, Tabor passed where the mill levy gets ratcheted down permanently um, to that voluntary reduction. So an act of, um, uh, of thoughtful um, governance by this board in terms of thinking about the impact it may have on our taxpayers may limit all future revenue in, uh, in the future, the ability to bring the, the, the mill levy back up to the voter approved level of, of 0.5 mills. Um, yeah. At 4%, right, at, you're right. You can keep, as long as it stays within that 4% growth rate, correct. Um, now, I have to say, you know, the, the legal interpretation of, of um, uh, Initiative 50 has not been established. The courts haven't ruled on it, hasn't passed. Don't know exactly how that will be handled. But that's that's my best guess. Peter, I don't know if you have thoughts on it. Um, I think that's a good summary. So the, the, the question for the board, um, you know, the other, let me back up the other, as you can tell from my memo, the other thing that we we are facing is a number of very high priority projects in terms of investing in either infrastructure, uh, repairing old infrastructure, all of the, the projects uh, of the nature that we invest in uh, through the CFP, 
as well as those high priority projects that have been on the board's agenda for literally decades um, are all very expensive. And, and um, the question is, is it appropriate for this board um, to not reduce its mill levy uh, voluntarily and give, give that, that temporary tax credit and actually retain that revenue and put it into our CFP to continue to invest it in our community? Um, you know, you can tell by the way I talk about it, I have strong opinions about it, but I, we need direction from this board as to how to do that. Um, and, and what, what you would like to see in the future presentation of the budget. Remember, we'll present the budget again in October. Normally you would be adopting a budget in October. That is not under, under any likely circumstance going to be what happens this year. So again, if prop HH. Does, does not pass, we can have a meeting in early December, set the budget, set the mill levy, and, and that would be your final decision point. If Prop HH passes, the counties have until December 29th to get us their revised valuations, and, 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 um, and we won't be able to make that decision until early January. It's not relevant to this okay. conversation. It's just yeah. opinion of Al. Okay. Uh, Director Haas on and this. Peter. Yeah, thank you. Just some questions. I am so far out of my lane on this one. I don't, I mean, I'm, I have not been paying attention to this issue. It's complicated, I know. But for when you say 500, if HH passes 500,000 less, are you talking about the 2023 numbers that yes. 29 million? Okay, so. Well, decrease of the increase. Okay, and then my second question is, or I don't know, maybe commentary, but as I said, I don't know this issue well enough. It sounds like things are still changing. Like there's, I'm guessing there's gonna be court cases over can, if a district like ours has passed voter, has done a voter referendum about taxes, does that, what does that mean? Like, I'm guessing there's just gonna be change for the next two years and is it is it a good idea to try to anticipate that change or do we wait and kind of see where the chips fall? So, Director Oz, I think there's going to be a tremendous change in the way the state approaches property tax. I, I can't possibly tell you how, right? And so, so you, you mentioned one potential litigation point, which is our interpretation of the statute that, that sets up HH that, that we believe clearly says, you know, our voter approved revenue from 2020 is exempt. But when Peter and I had conversations with council and, and um, head of uh, the, the special districts association, they had a different interpretation. They didn't think that our revenue would be accepted. We're not sure where they're getting that from because I, I, you know, the statute at least seemed clear on that point. But you're right, we may be challenged if we, if, and, we and frankly, we might be challenged by our own assessors when we say that's our mill levy and, and they say, no, you can't do that. And so, um, well, well, you know, it, it, it gets really, uh, as I said, really confusing pretty quickly. Um, I, I, you know, <coughs> Al, I apologize. I'm going to share an opinion. Um, <laughs> I, I think we're going to see a, a whole different statewide approach right. to property tax um, moving forward because I don't think Proposition HH reflects a, a consensus among anybody. Yeah. Um, other than maybe the governor's office on how to handle this. And so I, I think we're going to see different policy ev evolve in the next year or two. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know where it's going to go. Well, and that was my second point is kind of, it sounds like the legislature is going to have to want to take this up again as well. So, okay, just Peter and then Director Gray. Um, uh, two points. One is uh, I don't think the special district association was looking specifically at our right. situation. It was more generally about it. Can you override the, the proposition HH with a election going into the future? Or as we believe the language of HH is quite clear, any election before or in the future, it doesn't matter when it occurred, uh, is exempt from the HH um, mill levy restriction um so uh, um we feel pretty good about that our our total 0.5 mil was referenced in our proposition in our um 
a 7A um, uh, initiative. So, uh, you know, so it's all up in the air, as you know, Director Hawes, but I feel pretty, pretty good about, about that one. The other point was, um, uh, j just to clarify, I think in at least my read of proposition or initiative 50, which is the one that hasn't been voted on as possible for next year is that, is that you could go, you could, you can only increase 4% over the previous years revenue. So you wouldn't be able to climb back up to a total annual annualized uh, 4% increase, only 4% over the preceding year. So if your preceding year was, you know, a, a down year or, you know, 1% of, of, of increase in valuation, you're, you know, you're limited to go up 4% from that, not total. Correct. Director Greg and then Director Kern. Depending on whether H passes then, or if if we passes then, so it'd be premature to actually even set a direction. Probably right now, for me, it would be a, uh, another form that we don't know what the future holds. And um, Director Gray, I, I appreciate that. I, I the, the only direction that you might give us is you know we've got a budget that's prepared that shows. Um, HH not passing. Do you want us to create one that shows that it passed? Mm -hmm. Just so that you know. I, I mean, it honestly, though, is is uh, if our interpretation is correct, it's five hundred thousand. So that's up so in the air too. Yeah, yeah. And so it, but we won't know if our interpretation is correct at the time that you have to set the budget, because mm -hmm. if HH passes and we say it means one thing and somebody else says it means another, we may end up defending a lawsuit or some other entity might. Uh, but, but we'd probably want to set our budget so that if if we're wrong, we're not we're not spending money that's not there. Yeah, and and I think what you'll note as we get into the expenses part of this budget is that um, we're proposing putting the the, the the lion's share of this revenue into the CFP fund. So it would be very easy to to modify that allocation of funding. Um, well, that'd be a good place to put it. Uh, Director Curry. Thank you. So looking at switching gears to 50, Proposition 50, or Initiative 50, and this might be a question for Zane. Um, looks like petitions are due to the Secretary of State by December 15th because their title was approved and, and their petition was approved and their work is, are they working on signatures actively? Last report I have is they have exceeded I don't have my notes in front of me, but if my memory um, serves me, they had obtained well over 100,000 more signatures than required. So the likelihood of them meeting the threshold is high. So that would indicate to me then that, uh, that somebody's done some polling because this is a constitutional amendment and they have to hit that 55% um, out of the, you know, the, that percentage from each Senate district. So they wouldn't have gone this far if they didn't think it was somewhat feasible. I think that's a okay. fair statement. And, you know, just from a political strategy perspective, uh, waiting until um, next November will be waiting until the actual sticker shock of the increased valuation and therefore the increased taxes have hit people's pocketbooks and they're looking for some solution to that. And so if they find it at the ballot box the next November, that might might be the incentive. Director McGinnis. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. So uh, I've been looking at this pretty carefully ever since the uh, legislation and so on and so forth. And um, so as you know, Mesa County is a pretty conservative county. Uh, and generally, <clears throat> I I'm I think a lot of these districts, it's an absolute windfall that they're going to receive. They didn't anticipate it. They don't have the projects that need it. They're going to be inventing projects to fund them. 
and that level will never go back down again. And uh, um, so I think they should voluntarily step forward. But I don't think that's the situation our river district's in. We're in kind of a unique situation with a couple of big capital projects we have. And we're gonna need to have some pockets for that. And I think if we don't voluntarily lower our mill levy, uh, we'll get uh, one or two negative editorials, a day or two of negative press and some complainers, but that's it. And so I don't think we should be gun shy about that. Now, one, in, in looking at different funding for capital projects, but anyway, for just in general capital projects, some of the people that we're asking maybe to participate on this side, of, on that side of the mountain, they're grants. On this side of the mountain, they're saying, and I'll be a loan. And uh, by the way, we ought to have equity in it. So they may be saying we want equity. And I think we really need to have financial leverage to say we're not interested in an ownership partner. Now we have to look at the customer. I'm just generally concerned. If we don't have that leverage, financial leverage, it really weakens our position here. And I think that in this county, for example, on some capital project, at least my commissioners, and I think generally people would be very upset sharing ownership of something that's really along the here and so and so on and so forth. So kind of contrary to my general view, but I and it's it, it's early, but we have to remember we do have to set this budget. I mean, this is almost October. <laughs> so while we're all thinking about that, but I just wanted to mention, I uh, you take a look at it. And you also, you, you can look as Andy or whoever wrote the memo, which I think is excellent too. It's a lot of good points. It does bring up Colorado Mountain College, but that's an entirely different example. I mean, they don't have a little thing like we've got. And uh, uh, this is an opportunity that I think won't repeat itself. Now, when you look at, and Grand, excuse me, City of Grand Junction has never had more money ever than they have right now. That infrastructure money is just rolling in. You can tell by the construction and everything. Those kind of people are the ones I'm talking about. This is, you, you've got plenty of money. You can handle it. So I just uh, would urge all of us, not that I've led, you're all looking at it too, but this is a one-time opportunity that also kind of matches perfectly with other one-time major infrastructure opportunities we may have. So uh, that's my opinion, but that's my position. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Director McGinnis. It, it is interesting. There are a lot of these other entities, like towns especially, have other sources of revenue. Even Colorado Mountain College has other sources of revenue. Districts like ours are completely property tax and, and grant uh, funded, but property tax is it. So we don't have cushion or leeway to think about other revenues. We're gonna have a discussion about Proposition 50 and the proposed resolution from this board later in, in, the, in the meeting. So we can address kind of the, the, the other issues of proposition, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, proposition HH faces. Um, you know, HH um, isn't just a reduction in the um, property tax. It's an increase in the state's ability to, uh, to, to not refund the Tabor uh, money. So it's, it's, it, it's, a, um, it, it's being pitched as one thing. I, I think it's a, um, you know, from my perspective, a consolidation of financial uh, power into the state. And just to be clear, I don't think our district will ever be eligible for the backfill that they're advertising. So um, we're, we're, we're not likely to ever recoup that money that the state has collected. Um, Director Monger, I see you've got your mute off. Did you wanna weigh in? Yeah, so I just wanna be quick here a little bit. So I, I really appreciate that we've already discussed this a whole bunch and that we've already hopefully prepped everybody. Yeah, I'm uh, being an, a silly accountant by trade myself too. I, I, I kind of know, and I'm very familiar with what's happening. We had our upper Yampa Water Conservancy meeting yesterday. And uh, so actually staff, and I would suggest that we do this too, that, but staff provided a, uh, we've been de-Bruce since uh, 2005. 
and we did staff did a uh, analysis of the uh, CPI increase and our revenue increase at, over since 2010. And even with this new bump in money that we're ending up going to be getting 50% probably surplus money, even with that 50% bump in surplus money, we're still $300,000 less than what the inflation rate would have been for our taxes in 2000 and 2010. So I hope that makes sense. But yeah, so I mean, our taxes, and it's finally now that property levels and property valuations are catching up with what our inflation rates have been, and we're not been able to capture some of that money. So I, it's great discussion. And uh, thank you. That's, that's my comment. Thank you. Vice President Catlin, it appears you're in charge of the meeting. At the moment. Yeah, I'm currently in charge, okay. so let's go on with the discussion. <laughs> um, any further discussion? Um, I think what, I guess, unless I hear differently, we will prepare um, a, a budget discussion. In the October meeting, um, it may be su significantly truncated since we're not asking you to set the budget at that point, but we'll keep um, the current um, um, budget with no uh with hh not passing as the proposed budget um if, if you desire to direct us otherwise you can certainly uh do that but i that would be something different but that's where we're headed as a staff unless you direct us otherwise. i'd like to make a couple of comments i'm sorry just about if people don't know about hh they say yes after they've been shown what it will do they change and become a no vote. What I worry about is how many voters are not being reached in regards to HH. Typical homeowner says, oh, hey, cool, good deal. After they've been shown what it's doing, then they become a no vote. Man, we live in the land of unintended consequences, and I'm worried about it, you know. We can make our budget like it's going to fail, but I am really concerned that HH will pass. Just that's the guy sitting in this seat because, you know, we've had some presentations at home where they've, you know, come out, people are you know, they're, they're coming to find out, but there are not enough people in those rooms to find out. And then after a typical homeowner, has heard it, when they leave, you can see they're considering what they heard, but do they know it well enough to talk to the neighbors on both sides of the house and convince them, oh, Lou, you don't want to do this. I'm really worried about that because there's a lot of money being poured into passing it. A lot more money than closing. Yeah. You know, we were promised a lot more money with closing. So I'm concerned. Just Mark, where who, I'm at. Who, who's funding the inflation for it? For it? Well, I can't tell you the names, but just take a look at the ads. You know, I'm sure there's a lot more dark money and those kind of things in those in those organizations. Uh, I mean, this is something that some of the some of the people have been against Tabor since Tabor started. I mean, we've looked at a number of different things that have tried to put an end to tape. This one coming at this, you know, the perfect storm. We always talk about that guy, the perfect storm. This one kind of has a perfect storm to it. You know, people looking at triple, you know, doubling their, their property tax is such a shock that anybody that says, well, here's a way we can help, help you a little bit. But going from what 6.075 to 6.0 doesn't help a lot, but they can make hay with that, particularly with um, the backfills and those kind of things. So I'm I'm really concerned about it. And there's only a two or three organizations that are out opposing it: Independence Institute. Um, you know, there are two legislators that are going around the state trying to put on, you know, dog and pony shows. I just don't know how many people they can reach. That's what's my concern. 
That's all I've got. Yes, ma'am. Just one more question. How would HH and uh, N50 work together? Has anybody looked at that? Or we're not even looking that far out because it's too <laughs> uncertain and scary? Uh, I, I can tell you that I have not figured out how the two fit together. Yeah, other than that the reductions that are established by HH are the 4%, you know, that would be your new baseline that the 50, if it were successful, would be based against. So you, you, you'd come in at a, you know, uh, behind the eight ball already. And I think HH was put out there to sort of ward off 50. Um, so I think, yeah, it's just a double negative. If HH passes and 50 passes, it's doubly bad. It doesn't and 50 does, and it's still bad, but <laughs> not as bad. Mm -hmm. well, and I don't think it, I don't know if it will work that if HH passes, the 50 goes away. Probably not. Well, if, if we have no further questions on the, on the uh, clarity that we have on our future revenue scenario, um, maybe we'll, we'll turn to something we do have a little bit more clarity on, which is um, kind of the um, expense uh, expenses in the general fund and in and, 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 and our governmental fund. So um, as if Ian were here, he, I'm going to channel my energy in. He re remind you that we have a, 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 a governmental fund, which includes the general fund, the capital projects fund, and the um, uh, community funding partnership fund. So those three are funded with taxpayer money, as opposed to our enterprise fund, which is revenue generated uh, within our business enterprise for the district. And so we're, we're going to talk, uh, and Audrey will lead the discussion through the expense trends in the general fund and the um, uh, and then turn to the uh, capital at fund followed by the CFP. And so uh, Audrey, if you want to lead off, we're going to have some help from our various uh, department directors on staff um, to, to talk about these proposed expenses, both in 2023 and, and beyond. So. Yeah, so thank you. And again, you know, I have some highlights written out here, but where, if there's any particular items that you have questions about, whether it was in the director's detail or on the summary, Betty's got more information in the different directors too. So we're happy to, to go over those as needed. Um, but overall, we're showing a balanced budget for 2023. Um, and overall, the increase from the original budget to the proposed amended is almost 6%, so 5.64% which can mostly be attributed to, um, as we mentioned earlier, the um, work with the Freshwater Trust that was not included in the original budget, um, which is partially or really mostly funded um, and offset in the other income line up above um, in, through a CWCB grant, and then additional outreach efforts um, in the ex external affairs line item is a larger increase than what we had originally budgeted. Um, which we will go into some more detail later. Um, we have a decrease in directors and officers. Um, staff salaries line item also shows a decrease from the original budget to the proposed amended, which is mostly related to um, uh, more time being spent on enterprise activities. So if we were looking at the total salaries between the general and the enterprise, they'd be close to budgeted but you'll see an increase in, in the budget for the enterprise and a decrease here. So that's what that's mostly related to. Um, as, and the same sort of relationship with the salary overhead, um, more enterprise expenses. And, and just as a, a reminder, um, several years ago, we made a change to charge enterprise for the actual hours that are spent on there. We do have and included in our budget sort of some staff splits that we're based off of timesheet codes to see where people are spending their time. Um, but we are, so that's how we budget, but we do actually do the actuals based on the hours spent. Um, travel is also down from where we had budgeted, um, slight increase from 2022 though, um, as we are starting to get kind of back to um, doing our routine travel post COVID. Andy's, Andy's traveling a lot, it's Andy's line item. Um, 
there's also a, a slight decrease in the legal special counsel, which is just uh, due to less outside expenditures than originally budgeted. Um, the admin expenses is a very slight increase at you know around three percent, and that's related to our records management um, reconciliation project that we've been working on. And then you'll see, you know, a larger, the largest percentage increase in the external affairs budget line item, um, which is related to, as we mentioned, some in, so anticipated increased outreach efforts. Um, and then the last, you know, large increase is in that technical support line item, which is where we have the, the ASO effort, the Freshwater Trust and the Water Decision Support Tool work is also in that technical support line item. Um, as well as cloud seeding, and then additional modeling related to the phase four risk study and efforts related to CRCA implementation. Um, and so those are sort of, and then we also are, are still showing, uh, we'll be able to do a transfer, we're proposing to do a transfer to see a, an additional transfer to the CFP in 300,000 in addition to the routine annual transfer of the 4.2 million. And then we have the 3% TAVER contingency in there as well. So I'm happy to pause here and go through any questions that you all have on the 2023 proposed amended budget on any line items. Yeah, Dirk is again. So it's because I don't know, but on the enterprise zone, we're allowed, you know, if we were capped at a contribution of 10% per year that we would could put in to subsidize the enterprise operations. I think you can go up to 10% of taxpayer money without any of right. governmental funds right. can go governmental funds. It, correct in oh. and still maintain that enterprise um, status. Right. But then the enterprise can we can pull out of the enterprise zone. We don't have a cap if we pull it out. Correct? We can pull funds out. Uh, yeah I don't I don't see any there's no restriction on so the, what, what I was thinking about last night is with our loss of revenue, because Denver now is no longer paying us on the project, that they're now going to partner. So they have to pay maintenance. And I've mentioned, oh, I'm sorry. Jeez. So Denver, so what I was thinking of is because um, Denver's not paying us for the water now up on our project up north. They're now maintenance, they have the maintenance, but that was pretty good sum of money for the enterprise zone. I may be wrong on this, but that's what that I understand. So I'm wondering if the day if 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 we wouldn't be think about, even though they, they don't need it now, we have some extra funds to go ahead and start contributing up to 10% into the enterprise zone, anticipating that in the future as our revenues go down because we don't have our biggest paying or biggest revenue or one of our bigger revenue items. Coming in three or four years from now, we've been able to put some money in without any kind of penalty to prepare for that reduction in revenue. If you're following what I'm saying, yeah, I think I I understand what you're proposing. I guess oh, I'm not proposing. I'm just <laughs> starting out the discussion. Okay, good. Yeah. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, interesting. I don't off the top of my head see a prohibition on that. I'm not sure I see a, a enormous benefit either. The, the enterprise, before we, we were, we were, were de-bruced, we really relied on that 10% um, enterprise allowance in order to accept um, uh, state funds that weren't river district tax revenue um, grants, things like that from, from the state and non-federal non money, whether it was from the state or other um, tax supported entities within Colorado. Uh, and, and we could only do that up to 10% of our total annual enterprise budget. And um, now that we've been debruced, that element of the enterprise is not so critical. Maintaining the enterprise is, is you know, something that we're always interested in doing. And um, you know, I, I think in theory, you could invest general fund money into the enterprise uh, up to that limit, maintain the enterprise status if that were desired. And, and, and because we have the flexibility, so it's kind of like a savings account. So we have the flexibility to pull them back out if we needed it for any other purpose. In the meantime, we could end up with some excess revenues. Anyway, I just, just thought I'd mention that. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Should we move on to 2024 expenditures? All right, well, we already had an extensive discussion on the revenue. So you'll see in here the proposed 2024, we've got our property tax revenue at 4.2 million, which is a net property tax. So that's taking out the treasurer's fees and the other fees that Ian knows a lot more about. Um, and maybe we can ask Betty if we need to, but that's the net property tax. We've got, again, we're the speci specific ownership tax is a bit difficult to predict. So we're just showing um, the same budget number as 2023. And then again, we're anticipating that a continuation of the high interest rates on our investment. So uh, a relatively high interest income. And then the other income, as we mentioned, we're showing um, in anticipation of successful grant applications for um, the ASO Bureau of Reclamation grants, DK has informed me that we should know uh, by hopefully the end of September. And so we'll be able to, you know, if we are unsuccessful and that is no longer something we need to include in our budget, we'll be able to pull that out um, before we adopt the budget. But we figured it would be better to show that anticipation um, instead of adding it last minute as that, that large expenditure. Um, directors and officers, we have a pretty significant increase in our budget in 2024, and that is related to what we're, we're contemplating another um, board tour. And so, Andy, if you want to chime in on some of your thoughts there. Sure. Um, it, I, it seems to me that it's been a while since our board has um, looked at some of our intrastate issues that, that impact the district. And um, at staff, we'd like to recommend that in 2024, we organize for the board a tour of um, some of the, the larger uh, Trans Mountain diversions that take place here in, in out of our district and really go look at them and understand where that water's coming from, maybe hear from both the um, beneficiaries of those projects as well as the communities uh, that are directly at ground zero from the impacts and um, provide that opportunity for the board and staff to really see that on the ground. It's Again, it's one thing to talk about it, and I think we do talk about those all the time here, but to be able to see those projects, uh, I think would really help uh, further the, the knowledge and, and substantive conversations with, with this board. And, and I'm just looking for a little bit of direction. You don't have to make a vote or anything, but if you're in favor of it, We'll, we'll move on and, and design that tour. And, and I say that we, somebody behind me will uh, do that work, so. <laughs> um. And some feedback, maybe, Steve, Director Beckler. Yeah, I, I think it's a great idea. Would we, when would we go, spring, we, so we can actually see the diversions happening? Yeah. Peter, what do you think? Yeah. I think you have to wait until um, late part of early summer. Okay. Yeah. Spring is there's still too much snow up there, and some okay. of them haven't even turned on yet. Um, but I, I think it's a great idea too. I, just as an aside, I, when I was a younger lawyer, and, and just shows you how uh, non technically minded I am, I could not I can understand Trans Mountain diversion where you know there's water going through a pipe under the continental divide that made sense to me. What didn't make sense to me were the ditches that go across the continental divide by gravity. I could not get that into my mind <laughs> until I actually went up there and saw it. And so, you know, and, and then the, the fact that they built some of those in, you know, 19, 1910 or 1920, um, it, it, they're great tours. And I'd recommend it highly. Um, and I would point out the only other increase there in the directors and officers, um, I, I think it maybe is reflected more in 2025. Um, we currently have a, a board president who has declined the salary, the officer's salary, for, uh, and doesn't take that salary that is permitted by our bylaws. Um, we're anticipating that um, the term limits will prevent uh, President Chandler Henry from remaining as president beyond next year. And so 2025, that bump in there is, is, uh, is, is there for the increased salary. We do also, and, and we'll get into this, I think, in a minute, but um, we, it is a triannual salary survey year, um, as dictated by board policy, to go out and survey um, like institutions to see where their wages are. Um, we're recommending that the board consider directing us to see if we can get similar um, objective data on what board officers are paid 
um, so that we can compare. And I don't think we've ever done that as an organization, at least not that I'm aware of, but just trying to understand where we, where we fall. I will say um, your current officers uh, are very kind with their time. Um, whenever Peter and I and others need their help, we're, we're often on the phone with them and asking them for help. So I um, just, it, it's, it is a job that takes some time reviewing bills, approving them, um, those kind of things. So uh, just would, would keep in mind that um, it, it, is, it is not a, a small task that we're asking of people. It, it does allow for some diversity. I think a lot of towns are looking at increasing their pay to their town trustees just to allow people um, who might not be able to have unpaid time to do those jobs. Yes, Director McGinnis. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Steve Gummett. I would uh, and also just throw in board members on your on your surveys. They're going around and and just so you can get a little flavor of where that is as well. We can certainly do that. I think as the boards aware, our our board stipend um, is set by statute, but it wouldn't be bad to survey it and understand where other boards are paid and whether this board wants to uh, approach a, a change in the salary of a, the stipend through a legislative change. You might hear more from me about the advisability of opening up our statute. But that's <laughs> I would also say, Andy, in the 2025 budget, we also contemplated um, money for a tour as well if we wanted to look at um, maybe CAP or another outside of the basin tour right. or outside and, of the state tour. And, you know, for those of you who were able to participate in the CAP Central Arizona Project Board tour earlier this summer, they have extended the invitation back to us to bring our board down to them. And while it would be nice to go down next year, I, I think seeing the intrastate issues might be might be really more relevant this year um, but it, it's up to the board as to how to do that but we could we could the following year we could go down and see cap or somebody else and the cap tour would not be in the summer just to be clear okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay um moving on to staff salaries um we, and it was included in your memo, I have budgeted for a 5% increase in salaries for the, the salary pool. As a reminder, we use Employers Council survey data of um, re resort area regional employers. Um, they have gone through some restructure and so they have not published the latest data. And so that 5% is based on the preliminary data that was collected earlier this year, as well as some other national data service um, surveys. World at Work and Pay Factors and others. So again, they in, I, they said that they would hopefully have that um, information published by early October. So I will amend the budget to reflect what that actual survey result is. But there is a five percent included, and also um, included in there we have an additional. You know, we hired three more employees. Um, and so the staff salaries are shared between the general fund enterprise and CFP is where we divvied out those three additional people. Um, but we also will have a full year of that additional staff. And I also have included some contingency for salary survey increases. And I was looking at this number and I realized that there's, I've already found one mistake and I've got two. So the staff salaries number in the projected budget of 2025 did not carry over some of that contingency. And so I think that that number will be revised in the, for 2025, the projected budget to be um, increased there. Um, we also have, you know, a correlating increase in salary overhead. Um, I'm really been pleased with our participation in this healthcare group. Um, we're part of public sector healthcare group, which is special districts throughout the state. Um, and it gives us a lot of stability in our health insurance increases where as and before when we were um, mostly focused in, in West Slope and resort area employers, we were experiencing some pretty significant increases in our health insurance due to the, the high cost of care and the, the Vale and Roaring Fork Valleys. Um, and so we are looking at a, a slightly less than 4% increase in our health insurance premiums for 2024, as well as a flat renewal for our dental and vision and disability and, and life insurance. So um, happy to report that. And that's really kind of the only change as well as the increase in um, FICA 
and Medicare taxes, which are related to the increased limits on the, the salaries there. Um, travel and education is only or is, is up from the proposed amended, just anticipating that we will continue to be traveling and doing additional um, outreach efforts in the coming years. Um, and then and, and that also has some staff um, expense related to a tour that the board would do if we have the staff expense down in the travel and overhead. Um, yes. Just curious on the, I noticed there on, on some of the staff and travel and stuff, you're ex looking like you're gonna see a downturn in 2025. Is, are we thinking some positions will phase out or? Um, Betty, if you have the detail there, but I think that it's related to um, maybe the tour expense being down in 2025. But even your salaries are going from 2.9 to okay. 2.7. Yeah, so that's where I said that was the second mistake that I just oh, caught now okay. Sorry. Um, in recognizing <clears throat> that the contingency that we may experience with the salary survey, where if we need to do market adjustments to salaries in 2024, should have also been carried over to 2025. Mm -hmm. So legal special counsel, I don't think that there's um, anything. Well, maybe there is a balance. This is a note from Ian. So um, the balance on the CRCA implementation matters of 180,000, which was um, a carryover from revenues that we collected from some of our West Slope partners several years ago. And, and so we are anticipating um, expending some more of those um, funds in 2024, and then we have a $25,000 contingency in our um, legal special counsel line item for 2023 and 2024. Um, administrative expenses, we are showing um, a, a relatively significant increase in the 2024 proposed budget, and that's related to two consultants, one being the salary survey consultant and the other being is that we're proposing to do a strategic plan update, which we had, we thought we were going to get that done in 2023, but we decided to, maybe we'd shift it to the, the next year when we might have a better idea of some of our priorities. And so I would anticipate hiring a consultant to facilitate that with the board as well as staff. Um, so those are included in the administrative expenses. And if I could just speak to the um, strategic plan, um, that's the staff's recommendation, but if the board chooses not to, we, we don't need to revamp our strategic plan. The strategic plan was last done um, in 2016, 17? Yeah, 2016. It was adopted right. officially in 2017, but most right. of the work was done in 2016. So, so it's been a while, and, and as you know, the the staff relies heavily on the strategic plan as a guiding document that this board has set our policies. And so you, you'll recall maybe in an overly repetitive way, we put strategic plan guidelines or goals on each of our memos to show you how we're like keeping in alignment. It, it actually really does help the staff to, to, to keep on track. It, a lot of that plan is still relevant, um, but if you recall since 2016, we have, um, well, we passed 7A, we've opened up a whole new community funding partnership. We've uh, seen horrendous hydrology develop in the Colorado River or continue to get worse. There are, there are a number of issues that probably could be updated. This effort would require additional work from the board. Um, the last time we did a strategic plan, I can say I wasn't here either on the board or, or in this seat. But my understanding is that the board at that time spent a good day in a workshop in addition to all of the other meeting requirements. So um, if you want us to do it, we're happy to do it. We just ask for your partnership on that and, and, and anticipate your enthusiasm in that uh, uh, those extra efforts. So that's just a heads up on that one. So. You're up for it? Yep. Yeah, I think it's timely. Our political atmosphere has changed quite a bit too. That might influence some of our strategies that we're doing. Okay. Um, and again, I'm happy to, like I said, there's a lot of things that are included in these um, line items <clears throat> that are more routine that I'm not highlighting. I'm just kind of highlighting some of the changes. So if you guys have any questions on any details, we're happy to go into that level of detail. 
um, external affairs is showing, uh, you know, continuing um, education and outreach efforts um, go, moving through 2024 and 2025. Um, technical support, again, you'll see some pretty significant line items there in the expenditures, which is related uh, primarily the, the large increase um, from, you know, 2022 and original 2023 is that ASO uh, Bureau of Reclamation grant, which is around 650,000 that we have um, in that line item, uh, as well as um, we are anticipating that the, the Freshwater Trust and the Water Conservation, no, Water Conservation Decision Support Tool um, will be completed in 2023, but there is a chance that some of those expenditures will carry over into 2024. Um, we also have a technical contingency of $100,000 to address any unanticipated requests or projects that come up. Um, we also have included, as we have done for several years and have not expended, the $125,000 um, wild and scenic endowment fund contribution um, that may or may not come to fruition in 2024. Um, and we have in the Division 5 work plan, 50000 for development of conditional water rights and a 5% increase um, in our USGS um, support. So those are the major technical support line items. And then you'll see, you know, we have our annual transfer of $4.2 million into the CFP and then a very significant trans additional transfer of $4.3 million that we're showing in 2024 and 4.5 million in 2025. Dr. Benford. Question regarding the transfer or the community funding partnership. When Proposition 7A was passed, that was based upon the property valuations that would determine the value of that account. Wouldn't it be appropriate to say that we should see if our property values are going up, that we should see a similar type of increase to the community funding partnership. Um, Director Van Bank, we uh, we have in fact been putting any additional revenue through these additional transfers into okay. the, the CFP. Um, I think the direction from the board has been to keep um, the the base contribution at four point two million, but to leave it to the discretion of the board each year as to how much additional revenue we, we, we provide to the CFP, mainly to allow for um, uh, priority projects within the district to, to be developed. And I, so it, it, I, I'd say that it was, we, we definitely committed to the, the voters that we would contribute um, 4.2 million. Uh, I would say this board has been uh, well in excess of that since, since the, the um, passage of that. Um, I think it, in terms of just operational flexibility for the board's decision making in terms of where the priorities go, um, you know, we're we're happy to follow your lead. But I think having that that annual discussion about how much goes in helps the board or, or really organize its priorities, and so that's why we have it set up this way. That's fine. Thank you. And we'll we'll talk about the the CFP fund shortly as well. So any yeah questions in the general fund? Thank you. I had a question and I, I just remembered it. <laughs> so uh, I think this is under technical support. The Division Four work plan in the detail and the the sheets that got mailed out. You know the hard copies. Right. And I think it's uh, number 01036608. The division four work plan goes from $7,000 to $586,000 and then back down to 8,000. What is, what is that? Well, that luckily Brendan is here to describe that, I think. Sure, Brendan. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this was what was talking, discussed before uh, the water conservation decision support tool. Oh, that's under Division Four. Division Four. Oh, okay. So that's that okay. one year. Got it. That we're really working with. Okay. Thank that's you. The big fight in this board. Okay. Sorry, I didn't realize it was under that division. Okay. Thank you. No, it's all right.
Any other questions? All right, we can move quickly to the capital fund. All right, so we're showing the capital fund starting with a proposed amended um, balance of 5.363 million. Um, you may remember in 2022 when we had um, sort of the excess revenue and we had a discussion about <clears throat> whether to put all of that in the CFP and we were directed by the board to put 1.5 million into the capital fund, sort of in anticipation of some of the projects we had been talking about that time, our office remodel, as well as um, our water efficiency projects at our building. Um, and so you'll you'll see in 2022, we had that big, big transfer and we're not proposing to put an additional transfer into the CFP or to the capital fund in, in 2023 or 2024. Um, the capital fund is primarily used for um, purchasing computer equipment, office equipment, um, the water efficiency improvements, it was historically where we paid um, for our grant program and funded it out of the, the capital fund. But since the development of the CFP, um, we just had a few straggler um, grants that have all been been paid out. So um, we are in 2023, we have a uh, down in the computer. Oh, I make that slide. Uh, the computer services, um, we were paying for the grants management software. Um, you'll notice in 2024, we are proposing to pay for that straight out of the CFP fund. Um, but we do have some other expenditures in there for licenses and services, such as our Office 365, our Adobe licenses. And then the biggest line items here in 2023 um, and 2024 are related to our office remodel. Um, which is something that the executive committee discussed and approved um, at a meeting a couple weeks ago. We are anticipating moving forward with that um, in November. So it will cross over in 2023 and 2024. Um, and I will also be providing some more details to the board at our October meeting about the remodel and, and kind of what to expect from staff during that time. Uh, then we also have um, in that line item our our payment, our share from the condo association for the elevator remodel, or well, not remodel, um, modernization is what it is. It's, it's, an, it's a remodel of the elevator, um, which is also quite old and in need of updating, um, as well as updating the first floor restrooms, which are a common element in our building. Um, we're also showing some uh, related office furniture in 2020 for that 100,000, oh, sorry, mouse is getting a little, hey, wild. Um, and then we're also, we have a, in 2023, we hired a records management consultant to help us do some discovery work on some of our issues that we have and some um, developing a, a roadmap and path forward for us to fix some of our records challenges. Um, and then we also are contemplating installing and in maybe, we are going to install electric vehicle charging stations at our building as well. So we have some budget there. Um, Raquel has been working really hard on, on finding us um, some grant funding to assist with that expense. And then finally, the, the last large item is the budget for the water conservation and efficiency improvements, um, which are the, the landscape update that we've talked about around our building, um, which we've paid for out of the capital fund. And then we're also anticipating continuing um, changing out our vehicle for our fleets vehicles with hybrid vehicles. And so we have, we did um, buy and sell or trade in a vehicle this year. And then we are contemplating doing that again in 2024. So that's the capital fund. Any questions on the capital fund? On the remodel, yeah. So, how much did it go up in estimate? Is it, it looks like we're at what one point, maybe one point five, one point six million dollars. 
Yes. And we're also, and we're budgeting for an, an, an owner contingency as well in okay. there. So it's, it's roughly around 1.8 million is what we're holding, hopefully less than that, but yeah. that's about where we're at. Okay. The contract is a, is a 1.65 uh, million contract that we're negotiating authorized by the executive committee, but, but um, we're still working on the details. A fixed price contract, you know, but keeping that owner contingency available. Thanks. Um, Audrey, what's the, or, or Andy, the variation in the root eye water line goes up and down? Again, it's, but, uh, it's related to the O&M payments for the root eye contracts that we hold in the capital fund. Yeah, we get billed every, we get billed every year, depending on what they do, what kind of fluctuates every year. Why it's so low this year, but it's not good. Any other questions on capital? I, I would, I, I just want to remind the board, given that question about root eye water, um, that we do own about 2,400 acre feet of water in root eye through the capital projects fund. It was a decision this board made uh, quite some time ago. Um, when uh, the root eye water was available for contract and um, th this water was water that had been uncontracted by any other West Slope entity. We'd, we'd pushed for other entities to purchase water for their future needs. And this was left over. The board decided it was a good investment, um, wasn't needed for our water marketing program at the time. So we utilized capital projects fund money to buy it. It's been sitting in there and it's in it is separate than our water marketing uh, root eye water, just just so that uh, everybody can understand. Um, we have utilized that water for um, some in-channel in uh, uses as well as delivery down to the Palisade um, power plant just at, at certain times. Um, but it is, it, it, it is there uh, at some point, um, this board, may decide that that asset is something they want to sell or that they want to transfer over to the enterprise. But at this point, it, it sits in the capital project. Fund. CFP? OK. And I might invite Melissa to come up here as well. So Amy. If you didn't know, had her baby in August, so she is still out on maternity leave doing wonderful. We miss her very much. Um, but the CFP is rocking and rolling. Um, you can see we've got a proposed amended starting balance at uh, 7.945 million. We have our annual transfer of 4.2 million, the additional 300,000 um, from the general fund. And then investment interest again um, is going really well. We've got uh, we're budgeting or proposed uh, two hundred fifty thousand of investment interest income in the uh, CFP fund. Um, and then as far as the proposed amended project assistance fund for twenty twenty three, I'll let Melissa talk through some of that detail um, to help you understand that where she came up with that number. And then I want to just highlight. Um, the change for 2024 in expenditures, and we can talk in detail about that. But um, what we are proposing is the CFP, as we had discussed when we were talking about additional staff, is that we we would like to budget for the CFP to cover its um, essentially its overhead and, and and most of its administration cost, so including you know salary and overhead for uh, the employee time spent um, managing that fund as well as the travel and meetings and the grants management software as well. So you'll see that that is new proposed for 2024 and anticipate um, continuing that in 2025 unless, unless the board directs us to, to do otherwise. But Melissa, do you wanna talk about some of the project assistance expense line? Yes. Um, so we're, we're looking at um, some pretty time going through each grant um, and figuring out when these things are going to start their projects, when payments will come out. Um, and we're finding that the supply chain issues and sh shortages that we saw last year are lessening. And so many of our projects are getting going and starting this fall 
as well as we do see an uptick in requests in the fall. So we cautiously have budgeted a fair amount to be paid out this fall, um, just in case that, or just to cover us as we continue to watch each grant and move forward. But it's exciting. A lot of our grants are, are getting going after a long pause throughout the impacts of COVID. <laughs> it's just a quick question or comment. Should we, uh, should we uh, change our investment interest increasing every year since our fund balance is going up so high? Because it stays constant at 250. I'm guessing it's going to go up to 400. Or... You know, uh, Director Beckley, I think that's a, a good suggestion. I, I know that, you know, that interest income in particular is um, a bit of a crystal ball, right? I mean, I, we all think interest rates will remain high for, for the next few years. Um, hard to know if, if there is an economic slowdown or something, what the Fed will do with, with those interest rates. So I, uh, we certainly, I, I can suggest to Ian that we bump those up. You're not, you're not wrong. I mean, it's certainly by the time we get to 2025 under this, this projected uh, budget, there, there's a, we should be receiving significantly more interest income at that point in time. So. Um, yeah, hopefully. Although you'll see, you know, we had twelve thousand in the budget for original for twenty twenty three, and and now we're anticipating two hundred fifty thousand. So if we didn't. I mean, even just a, nine months ago, we didn't yeah, anticipate if, this. If you have eighteen million dollars in the bank, you're probably going to get close to a million dollars in interest. I mean, that's a significant. It, it is. It is. Yeah, and I will just you know commend Ian. Um, he does pay attention to that that and is trying to make sure that we're putting. Um, in safe investments, but also making sure instead of it just sitting in the bank that we're, we are getting the best interest rates that we can. Um, so I think we, we certainly could show that for a projected amount for 2025. You know, we do show 2025 projections, although the board doesn't adopt anything related to that at this point. Any other questions on CFP? And I mean, I would just point out that, you know, what, what we're doing and we talked about this earlier when in the discussions about the, the lack of clarity we have with HH and initiative 50 but we are in 2024 and 2025 recommending really significant transfers from the general fund into the capital uh, or into the um, CFP fund um, just want to remind the board um, a that, that's a bit of an uh, at this point the crystal ball is pretty fuzzy in terms of what the actual income will be but B um, you move it into the CFP, you can, in fact, move it out to the CFP if you decided to do that. So it's not as though you're losing that discretion as, as a board. Um, I, think it's a, I, I think it's an appropriate uh, thing to do given some of the large projects that we have uh, on our immediate horizon for the district to, to have this revenue um, in, it, in it. As we've discussed, it, for those projects, it may avoid the district having to incur interest expense at, at the taxpayer's expense. So we would, we're, uh, it, it's this perverse way of getting these projects done without borrowing money. And therefore it actually is uh, financially uh, uh, much better for our taxpayers to, to do it that way. Um, and I, you know, I think it's, it's a, it, it is a, um, it, it would be great to have a balance where we can actually make some major projects occur. And, and so I, I, I look at these end of year budget numbers and carryovers as an extremely positive thing for our district be, to be able to drive our priorities within the district. Um, and I like seeing that intent that there is a plan for somewhere someday. Don't know where, but yeah, right. Keep keep going. I have some ideas. I do too, but it's nothing, <laughs> not, nothing. It's not real Blanco. It's, okay. it's everywhere, yes. but we appreciate the thought. Yeah. yeah. Um, cause there's other great projects that I know out there cause Western Colorado is growing yeah. and we've got water supplies that are going to need assistance and to meet the water quality requirements, just like, you know, project seven. Yeah. Fires. I mean, I, I can see, I can go on right. and, and these things are hundred million dollars, $50 million, $24 million. 
that's one small piece of it, but it will definitely help these communities. All right, are we good to move on to enterprise? You guys doing all right? It's not as excited as Ian is about the budget, but I'm trying, <laughs> trying. Okay, so going into the enterprise, um, we have a proposed amended uh, beginning balance, which is consistent with the original budget of $29 million um, and, you know, Director Beckley related to what you were saying there, we're looking at a million dollars in interest income um, in 2023, and we are projecting out a million dollars for 2024 and 2025, which we can look at adjusting perhaps. Um, anticipating interest rates will stay strong. Um, we have rent and miscellaneous income there, which is mostly related to our uh, we have an office space um, for our maintenance manager in our building that the River District owns and, and the condo association leases, as well as um, the, the general fund pays the enterprise fund for renting out the um, boardroom um, and the office space downstairs. Uh, a small management fee there. That's an Ian question again, or a Betty question. Um, and then we do have a few outstanding, the, the remaining grants that we had originally accepted in the enterprise fund because of our Tabor limitations and the general fund. And so we anticipate that those will uh, be completed, the Yampa Idaho BOMP um, and the Crystal River Augmentation Plan. Um, our expen we are anticipating finishing expending those in 2024. So there's some payout there in 2023 as well. Just to be clear, that's not our grant program? Right. No, it's not our grant. Yeah, it's it's grants, grants we received. received. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So the pass through funds there. Um, water sales. Um, we are showing a slight decrease um, from the original approved budget of 2023 down to 1.65 million. Um, and that also includes a one year contract with the CWCB for the root eye releases. ICE ice releases, ice mitigation, ice. ice mitigation releases, um, anchor ice. That's what it says. Okay. Um, and then we're also showing a consistent, um, increase in water sales as well for 2024 and 2025. Um, and as director McGinnis mentioned, uh, the Denver water payments, you know, for the, the 3 million annual have now gone down to just their share, their proportionate share of 45.33% of our O&M expenses. And that's what that Denver water income line item is. Um, that, that actually, just to be clear, is O-M and R, the R being and R. repair and rehabilitation. Thank you for that clarification. Um, okay, and then I had, buddy. The project, oh, never mind. Project contributions is okay. So, Water Smart grant, um, which was helping fund our demand management stakeholder group, um, the risk study phase four um, work, and the water bank work group. Um, the final year of that is in 2023 um, of 124,000, as well as um, some other outstanding purchase orders that we had previously gone through the enterprise fund. Um, that's the project contributions. And to be honest, I'm not really sure why some of them are grants and some of them are project contributions. I feel like they should be the same. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we we are showing a, a slight decrease in the um, from the original approved um, for the rec area revenue up at Wolford. You know, I think since um, people are back to more of their routine. Uh, staying at home, not out recreating as much. Um, the campground revenues have gone down from when the, the significant increase we saw during COVID. Yeah. Um, okay, so now down into expenses. Um, directors and officers, a slight decrease, um, which I think is mostly related to um, what Andy was saying with the officers not taking or officer not taking salaries 
um, the salaries line item for 2023. So you'll see there's a 9.4 increase and a 12% increase in 2024. And like I said, that is mostly related to the shift in staff time um, spent on enterprise activities, primarily Wolford. Um, and then um, we also have, like I said, the third employee, well, one of the three employees whose salary between that um, individual Sam and Hunter's salary were anticipating um, enterprise paying for one of those FTEs there. Um, travel, no, we don't have to go to that. Legal special counsel, you'll notice is a large line item from historical practices and, and that's um, related to our outside counsel um, efforts there. Administrative expenses uh, are related to um, the shared in the um, consultants there. Le Peter, did you want to add anything on the legal? Are you okay if I keep moving? I'm okay. Moving. Okay. All right. So, um, Wolford Mountain Reservoir. Okay. Okay. Wolford Mountain Reservoir is really Wolford Elkhead and the Yampa River projects are where our large expenses are in the enterprise. Um, we have increased costs in Wolford, primarily related to um, increased lab testing efforts, um, geotechnical analysis, uh, and we are also planning to do an update to our risk assessment in November. So we have, and which the board approved a contract with a facilitator in July, and we have anticipated increased expenditures for our subject matter experts to help us through that risk assessment. And we do have money budgeted in 2024 and beyond to continue implementing um, any recommendations, additional recommendations that come out of that effort. We've also had, I think as Hunter has shared at past meetings, we've had some maintenance issues coming up um, with trash rack recovery and valve repairs on our outlet works. Um, and so we don't have any extraordinary maintenance proposed, but we do have some budget in there to address some of those maintenance items that inevitably will arise. The Yampa River projects is related to our elk head expenditures, and we are, and we will in talk, be talking with the board in October, are anticipating an increase um, in expenditures related to SCADA implementation at elk head reservoir. Um, we had um, contracted with an entity to do a feasibility study and analysis for SCADA, and now we're, we will be moving forward with implementation. Um, and we have been in communication with our partners also at Elkhead and there, they will have a cost share component in that as well. How does the CPW portion work into the Elkhead Reservoir operations? Is that an income or an expense or is it a freebie? It's an expense um, for the running the campground. Yep. Yes. So it is an expense. We have an, ag an agreement with them. It is folded into our expenses with our partners. I believe it's $30,000 okay. per year that we are paying CPW um, to manage the recreation area okay. for us. Right. I will say it's, um, it works really well, uh, at least from a staff side of things, as far as you know, we handle the, the maintenance and the things that are coming up uh, related to the dam and reservoir, but not the, the recreation aspects. I understand. I just never seen it as a specific call out in anything. And I'm just kind of curious where that's at. Yeah, it is under that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Eagle River projects, I believe is our, our uh, cost share related to um, the Eagle River MOU. And we can call Brendan up to talk about some of these things. And then the Roaring Fork project um, line item is related to our root eye contracts and ONM. You can tell where my notes ended last night around 11. <laughs> um, and project development, we do have, um, again, the Yampa IWMP um, is part of that expenditure, which is offset in that grant revenue up above. Um, we have the ERO supplemental watershed plan, which was a carryover from a, a CWCB grant funded up above as well, which we are anticipating wrapping up sometime soon. And then Crystal River, 
Crystal River Augmentation Study as well is under the project development. Any questions? You guys are too nice. Okay. I mean, that's our budget. That is the, the budget. I uh, appreciate your engagement on that. I know um, you, most of you are on this board to talk about water policy, so uh, financial budgets are always challenging. We appreciate your eyes on it, though, and making sure that we're doing things appropriately with taxpayer funding. Um, I might recommend, uh, Madam President, that we take a, a short break before we dive into um, general counsel's report, um, if, if you don't. And maybe right before that, just give us your best guess of process from here for budget. Okay, um, excellent question. The process for here from budget, we would anticipate in October that we would come back to you with a request to approve the amended 2023 budget so we would finish the 2023 budget um, as as was presented here we would normally also at that time in october ask you to to approve the 2024 budget we will not be able to do that just as a reminder um, so we would anticipate depending on the outcome of hh either calling a special meeting for late november or early december um, to uh, if HH does not pass, if HH does pass, we would anticipate calling a meeting on, on New Year's Eve at approximately 10 <laughs> o'clock at night. Uh, <laughs> no, we, but we actually can't have a, uh, uh, that meeting. The, the um, state has given local taxing or, or the assessors the, uh, until December 29th to get us and all of the other taxing entities our, our, our uh, numbers. And so, honestly, we anticipate a meeting in the first week of January to approve our uh, 2024 budget. Right, because we have to provide ours by January 5th. Yes. Right. Uh, yeah, Director Monger and then Director Curry. Yeah, so real quickly, so Andy and uh, Audrey, I appreciate the presentation. You guys did great. I guess, our, <clears throat> did we fulfill our responsibilities here? Seems like we should be giving you direction or either a thumbs up or a motion to be for for you that we approve the initial budget as presented with retrain, retaining all of the surplus property tax revenues. Are we going to do that later or are we doing it now or a thumbs up or whatever, but we should be providing direction there. Thank you. Excellent question, Director Monger. We we um, really were just looking for general direction. I think we received direction through um somewhat of your silence that that we will uh, move forward with the with the budget as generally prepared and presented here with some refinements um you know and and in october uh you'll have an opportunity with respect to 2024 to to change course if you decide to do that in october um and of course you'll actually have your final opportunity either in early december or early january depending on on how that how that plays out Director Curry. Thank you. And I, <laughs> I was, uh, when, what date do we have to certify the mill levy by? January 5th? January 5th. Yeah. If, if it passes, yes. Okay. Yeah. If it doesn't pass, it's December 15th. You can thank last minute legislation for all of this, right? <laughs> not like government is offices are full in December. A lot of them take holiday for the month, which really seems like they're forcing the I, government to work I, now. I want you to know that our office itself will be being demolished at that time, but our staff will be in the building. Not demolished. Not <laughs> you should get so. out of the building. <laughs> yeah, the I feds and state employees can't do this, but they're going to trickle down and, and, and have the county yeah. in any way. I'll, I'll, I'll quit. <laughs> Uh, Director Hazard, did you want to weigh in at all before we take a break? Sorry, I appreciate um, the detail and and the chance of participating by Zoom. But um, I, again, I think everything's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hazard. All right, we will take a 10-minute break. Um, be back at 2.50.
I am ready. All Madam right. Uh, we will reconvene. It is 254. Uh, we have a memo from Peter Fleming in our electronic board document starting on page 40. And uh, Peter, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Madam President. Um, uh, in um, uh, contemplation of the agenda for the matters tabbed up for proposed discussion and executive session, I would make a recommendation to the board uh, that it convene into executive session pursuant to CRS section 24-6-402 per N 4 B and E to discuss the matters on the special meeting agenda um, tab three. Okay. Do we have a motion? Second. A motion. Uh, motion by Haas, second by Rober. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion's approved. Thank you, Madam President. I state for the record that the um, subject matter of the um, uh, executive session will constitute attorney client communications and that no further recording of that, uh, that discussion needs to be made. So during the executive session portion of the River District Special Board meeting uh, today, the board uh, discussed with council the items listed under agenda tab three um, and received um, advice and counsel from uh, 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 attorneys. Um, there was one action um, contemplated for um, proposed action um, and um, I'm happy to take that. I would ask Marielle or Zane to correct me if I get this wrong, but the proposed action would be to delegate to the executive committee of the River District um, authority to approve uh, a contract uh, in the amount up to $100,000 uh, for the retention of a strategic communication consultant related to CRCA implementation matters. Okay, do you have a motion? Okay, moved by Catlin, second by Curry. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, any opposed? All right, motion passes. And the last thing on our agenda is a consideration of a resolution opposing Proposition HH. And we do have that in our packet, Zane. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, included in your packet is a draft resolution in opposition to Proposition HH. I did include a cover memo uh, that spelled out some of the particulars of the proposition. Um, we received a, a more detailed briefing about the fiscal impacts to the district of said proposition earlier. Um, I'm happy to go into some of that. I, I re also recognize we're well over time. Um, so I'll shut up and ask for questions right now. Any questions for Zane? Uh, notable that it's September and this is resolution number one. <laughs> we need to get pictures. <laughs> we moved resolutions after policies. Yes. Yeah, we have. All right. Do we have a motion? I'll make that motion to adopt the resolution as presented on Proposition Second. HH. Second. All right. Uh, moved by Vandenbrink, second by Rober. All those in favor? Uh, any opposed? All right. We are adjourned. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs> Go get we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks.